So over here we have May, June 2022, paper 22. Question number one says, magnesium has a high melting point of 650 degrees Celsius and high electrical conductivity. Explain these properties of magnesium by referring to its structure and bonding. So over here we have to explain the relatively high melting point as well as the high electrical conductivity in terms of its structure and bonding. Now magnesium is a metal, right? Which means that it has strong metallic bonds, right? Because it has a giant metallic structure. So magnesium has a giant metallic structure. Okay, Mg has a giant metallic structure. With strong metallic bonds, with strong metallic bonds, you can also say strong electrostatic forces of attraction. Right, metallic bonds are just electrostatic forces of attraction between cations and delocalized electrons. Okay, attraction between cations and delocalized electrons okay and putting that in parentheses you can just say metallic bond or you can refer to what metallic bonds are therefore it has a high melting point it has a high melting point okay you have to justify the physical properties by referring to the structure and we know that it conducts electricity because it conducts electricity due to the presence of delocalized electrons, okay? Due to the presence of delocalized electrons in the giant metallic lattice. When magnesium is heated in air, magnesium oxide is the major product. Smaller amounts of magnesium nitride are also made. Calculate the oxidation number for magnesium and for the nitrogen species in magnesium nitride to complete table 1.1. Now in magnesium nitride, okay, in magnesium nitride, magnesium is a group 2 metal, right? So that's a 2 plus ion. So magnesium has an oxidation number of plus 2. Okay, and then nitrogen is in group 15. Okay, nitrogen is in group 15 and it gains 3 electrons to complete its octet. That's the nitride ion. The nitride ion is N3 minus. Okay. So Mg is 2 plus. Mg has a charge of 2 plus magnesium, and then the nitrogen has a charge of 3 minus. That's the nitride ion. So you get Mg3 N2. So the nitrogen has an oxidation number of negative 3. Identify the type of reaction which takes place between magnesium and nitrogen. Explain your answer. Now this is a redox reaction. Okay, elemental magnesium is reacting with nitrogen to form magnesium nitride, Mg3N2. Right, so we have 3 Mg plus N2 gives us Mg3N2. And since both magnesium and nitrogen in the reactants are in their elemental form, right, they have an oxidation number of 0. Whereas in the products, right, magnesium has an oxidation number of plus 2 and nitrogen has an oxidation number of negative 3. So the magnesium is being oxidized. Okay, the magnesium is being oxidized and the nitrogen is being reduced. Magnesium is losing electrons, undergoing oxidation from zero to plus two. Nitrogen is gaining electrons, undergoing reduction, right, from zero to minus three. So this is a redox reaction, okay? And we have to justify this. Why is it a redox reaction? We have to explain our answer. So we can say that magnesium, magnesium is oxidized, from 0 to plus 2, okay, you can refer to the changes in oxidation number or you can mention the fact that magnesium loses electrons, hence it's oxidized, okay, and then nitrogen is reduced from 0 to minus 3. Again, you can refer to the changes in oxidation number, right, there's a decrease in oxidation number, it's becoming more negative or you can refer to the fact that it's gaining electrons okay you can explain why this is a redox reaction in terms of oxidation numbers or in terms of electron transfer
define enthalpy change of formation. So the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change, okay, it's the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance, okay, when one mole of a substance is made from its constituent elements in their standard states, okay, constituent elements in their standard states. Now over here, if this was the standard enthalpy change of formation, if this was a standard enthalpy change of formation, then the one mole of a substance being made would also have to be in its standard state and the elements would have to be in their standard states under standard conditions. So this is not the standard enthalpy change, this is just enthalpy change of formation. So the substance is not necessarily in its standard state, if you're making one mole of a substance, okay, doesn't have to be in a standard state, but the elements have to be in their standard states, okay, for it to be an enthalpy change of formation. When 3.645 grams of magnesium solid burns in excess nitrogen to form magnesium nitride, 23.05 kilojoules of energy is released. Calculate the enthalpy change of formation of magnesium nitride. Show your working. So over here we have the following reaction. Okay, we have magnesium reacting with nitrogen to form magnesium nitride. Since we want to find the enthalpy change of formation of magnesium nitride, we have one mole of magnesium nitride, and then we're going to have three mg and one n2. So we want to find the enthalpy change for one mole of magnesium nitride being made, right? That's the enthalpy change of formation. That would be for one mole. That would be for one mole of magnesium nitride. So we first need to figure out how much magnesium nitride is being made to give us an energy change of negative. 23.05 kilojoules, right? This is the energy being released, so the enthalpy change is negative, right? Energy is being released, so the enthalpy change is negative, okay? So the first thing we can do is we can find the number of moles of magnesium. That's the information given in the question. So we can say that the number of moles of magnesium is the mass divided by the molar mass of magnesium. The mass is 3.645 grams, and the molar mass of magnesium is. 24.3, right? That's relative atomic mass. That's relative atomic mass of magnesium. The number of moles of magnesium is 3.645 divided by 24.3. So we get 0 0.15 moles of magnesium. So then how many moles of magnesium nitride are being made? For every three moles of magnesium, we get one mole of magnesium nitride. For every three moles of magnesium, we get one mole of the compound. So the number of moles of magnesium nitride will be one third of 0 0.15. So the number of moles of this is 0 0.15 divided by 3, which is 0 0.05 moles of magnesium nitride. So 0 0.05 moles of magnesium nitride forming releases 23.05 kilojoules. Okay. I'm putting a negative sign here because this is the amount of energy being released. Okay, so that's why it's a negative sign. So then what is the energy released? if one mole of magnesium nitride were to form. That would be your enthalpy change of formation. So over here we can cross multiply. We can cross multiply and we get the enthalpy change of formation of magnesium nitride as negative 461 kilojoules per mole. Okay, negative 461 kilojoules per mole. So that's our answer. Again, the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change for every one mole or per mole of magnesium nitride being made. So you can take this energy change and divide by the number of moles, right? Per mole would mean take this energy change and divide by the number of moles. If you do negative 23.05 divided by 0 0.05, you get negative 461. Here we have question number two. It says radium is an element found in group 2 of the periodic table. It is a crystalline solid at room temperature and conducts electricity. Radium chloride has a melting point of 900 degrees Celsius and is soluble in water. Part A says predict the lattice structure of radium chloride 
based on the properties described. So radium chloride, radium chloride is a fairly high melting point. It's soluble in water, right? It's a metal and a non-metal over here. So this is an ionic compound. The lattice structure is a giant ionic lattice. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show the arrangement of outer electrons in radium chloride. So let's say we're going to use dot for the electrons of radium and cross for the electrons of chlorine. Okay, so we have two chloride ions for every one radium. Now chlorine is in group 17. Chlorine is in group 17, right? It has seven valence electrons. It gains one electron from the radium to form the chloride ion. That's Cl minus, right? So in radium chloride, we have Ra2 plus, and then we have two Cl minuses, right? So for the chloride ion, we're going to have two chloride ions. So we're going to have two chloride ions and one radium in the center. Okay. So for the valence electrons of radium, over here, radium is in group two. Okay, radium is in group two. So it has two valence electrons. Okay, it has two valence electrons. And when it forms a two plus ion, when it forms a two plus ion, it loses its two valence electrons, right? Now, once it loses its two valence electrons, right? Again, radium is in period six. Radium is in period six. So it loses its two valence electrons, is six S2. Okay, it ends in six S2. It loses its two valence electrons. So now the fifth shell is full. Okay, and the fifth shell has a lot of electrons. Okay, it has a lot of electrons. So for the valence electrons of radium here, since we don't have an octet, okay, we can just show an empty, we can just show an empty shell. Okay, again, radium had two valence electrons. Okay, and it lost those two valence electrons. It lost those two valence electrons when it made the two plus ion. Okay, so over here we don't need to show we don't need to show the remaining valence electrons in the fifth shell. Okay, we can just show the empty, we can just show the empty outer shell for radium. Okay, because this is a relatively complicated electronic configuration or structure. We don't need to worry too much about the fifth shell over here. Okay. And then as far as the chlorine is concerned, chlorine had seven valence electrons. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, and then it gains an electron from the radium, like this. Okay, and then the same thing for the other chlorine. Okay, the same thing for the other chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, and then it gains an electron from the radium. Radium has a charge of two plus, and then the chlorines have a charge of one minus. Right, they're the chloride. Ions. I'll repeat, radium is in period 6, it only has 2 valence electrons, okay, in the 6th shell, whereas the 5th shell has 50 electrons, okay, it has a lot of electrons, so in this case, we don't need to show the 5th shell that's left over, we can just show the 6th shell as being empty, okay, those 2 valence electrons that radium have, have been lost, and each of the chlorines has gained 1 valence electron. Solid radium and calcium show similar reactions with H2O, but the reactions occur at different rates. Separate samples, each containing a single piece of solid radium or calcium, are added to equal volumes of cold water. Each sample contains equal numbers of moles of solid and the H2O is in excess. So we're using equal amounts. We're using equal amounts of radium and calcium and we're reacting them with an excess of H2O. Construct an equation for the reaction of radium with H2O. When a group 2 metal reacts with water, right, it's a reactive metal reacting with water, and we get the hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Okay, So here radium metal will react with H2O to form radium hydroxide, which will be RaOH2. Okay, Again, remember hydroxide is 1 minus, Ra is 2 plus, so we'll have RaOH2, and we get hydrogen gas. Okay, And then we're going to have 2 H2O here. Identify which element, radium or calcium, reacts with H2O at a faster rate. Suggest how the observations of each reaction would differ. Now over here, okay, the solubility of the group 2 hydroxides increases down the group. So magnesium hydroxide is fairly insoluble. It's very, 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 very partially soluble. So we can call it insoluble. Calcium hydroxide is partially soluble. And then strontium, barium, and so on are soluble, okay? Again, I'll repeat, the solubility of the hydroxides increases down the group 
okay solubility of the hydroxides increases down the group so radium hydroxide would be the most soluble okay of these five and magnesium would be the least soluble however since we're using an excess of water we won't see a precipitate form as the reaction is taking place and we might eventually see a precipitate of calcium hydroxide as more and more forms however how do we distinguish between the two reactions as they're taking place down the group the rate of reaction also increases okay the rate of reaction also increases because the valence electrons are further away from the nucleus right the atoms are larger so radium will lose its electrons much more readily okay those outer electrons aren't being attracted as strongly by the nucleus right they're further away experience greater shielding right so the rate of reaction will be faster with radium okay radium would react at a faster rate but the observation over here as the reaction takes place won't be that we're going to see a precipitate of calcium hydroxide because we're using water in excess we may see a precipitate eventually but as the reaction takes place we would see bubbles form faster okay bubbles would form faster with radium okay than with calcium another observation that you would see over here is another observation here is that the solid metal will dissolve faster in the case of radium so solid radium will dissolve faster okay because it's reacting faster than calcium suggest why these reactions occur at different rates so again as i mentioned down the group it's easier to lose the valence electrons right and a measure of that is the first and second ionization energy since these guys form two plus ions so we can say that the ionization energy the ionization energy decreases down the group right? the ionization energy decreases down the group okay that explains why the reactivity increases down the group okay so we can say that as the number of shells increases as the number of shells increases right the shielding and atomic radius increase right shielding and atomic radius increase hence the valence electrons experience weaker nuclear attraction okay experience weaker nuclear attraction so reactivity increases okay so reactivity increases down the group so it's easier to lose electrons down the group that's what we mean when we say ionization energy decreases down the group one of the solutions is cloudy when the reaction is finished at the end of each reaction universal indicator is added to each reaction mixture suggest ph value of the solutions made in both reactions explain your answer so we're getting the group 2 hydroxides in both reactions right so it'll be an alkaline solution in each case and the ph will be greater than 7 for both the ph will be greater than 7 for both right but since radium hydroxide is more soluble it'll have a greater ph okay it'll have a greater ph since you're using equal amounts you're using equal amounts of radium and calcium and we're getting a cloudy solution here that is of calcium hydroxide okay that is a precipitate of calcium hydroxide that's causing the cloudiness so eventually we do see that precipitate form so that means lesser calcium hydroxide is dissolved in solution so over here we can say that the ph will be equal to 10 or 11 for calcium hydroxide okay and whatever value you choose you have to make sure that the value you choose for radium hydroxide is greater so you can say 12 or 13 okay for radium hydroxide okay these values don't have to be exact okay they don't have to match the values i've given as long as they're both greater than 7 and the value for radium hydroxide is greater and the reason why is that the solubility solubility of group 2 hydroxides increases down the group
right? It increases down the group. So radium is more soluble. Okay. So radium is more soluble than calcium. Hence, it has a higher pH. It forms a more alkaline solution. A sample of aqueous calcium halide, CaX2 aqueous, contains either chloride, bromide, or iodide. Complete table 2.1 to describe a two-step process that could be used to identify the halide ion present. So we want to test for the halide. We want to test for the halide ion using a two-step method. So we can use aqueous silver nitrate. Okay, we can use aqueous silver nitrate in the first step, followed by aqueous ammonia. Okay, aqueous silver nitrate. And then we can follow it up with, follow it up with aqueous ammonia, NH3 aqueous. Over here, we're going to use dilute aqueous ammonia. So what's the first observation that we see with the chloride? So first, we're going to see a white precipitate of silver chloride. So the observation is white precipitate, which then dissolves in aqueous ammonia. Okay, with calcium bromide, we're going to see a cream precipitate. We're going to see a cream precipitate of silver bromide, which partially dissolves. It partially dissolves. And then with iodide, we're going to see a yellow precipitate, a yellow precipitate of silver iodide that does not dissolve in aqueous ammonia. So here we have question number three, part A. 0.025 moles of hydrogen iodide is added to a closed vessel and left to reach dynamic equilibrium. The total pressure of the vessel is 100 kilopascals. Part 1 says explain what is meant by dynamic equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium is when in a reversible reaction, okay, when in a reversible reaction, Okay, the rate of the forward reaction, the rate of the forward reaction is equal, is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. Okay. In a closed system. Now that's the definition. We have to explain what is meant by dynamic equilibrium. So when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction in the closed system, it means that the concentration of products and reactants does not change over time. Okay. Concentration of products and reactants okay, is constant over time or does not change over time. Okay. That's how we know when a system is in dynamic equilibrium. Okay, so that's what we have to mention when we're explaining dynamic equilibrium. So the first part is the definition, and the second part is the observation. Okay, what we observe when a system is in dynamic equilibrium. Part two says describe one difference in the initial appearance of the reaction mixture compared to the mixture at equilibrium. Now, initially, initially just hydrogen iodide was added to the reaction mixture. Okay, hydrogen iodide is a colorless gas, right? It's just white fumes. They appear white, but it's actually just colorless. So initially we just added hydrogen iodide and eventually what happened was, eventually some iodine formed. And iodine is a purple vapor, okay? So the difference in the initial appearance compared to the mixture at equilibrium is that at equilibrium we have iodine present. So we're gonna see a purple vapor, right? So colorless gas forms a purple vapor, okay, purple vapor. Write an expression for the Kp for the reaction described in equation 1. The Kp is just the partial pressure of the products divided by the partial pressure of the reactant. So we have partial pressure of hydrogen times partial pressure of iodine. Those are our products to the power of 1, right, because the 
stoichiometric coefficient over here is just one. So partial pressure of hydrogen to the power of one times partial pressure of iodine divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide squared. Okay, because the stoichiometric coefficient for HI is two. At equilibrium, the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide is 86.4 kilopascals. Calculate the amount of HI gas present in the mixture at equilibrium. Show your working. So we have this equilibrium. So we have this equilibrium where hydrogen iodide is forming hydrogen and iodine, right? They're all gases in this equilibrium. We want to find the amount of hydrogen iodide present at equilibrium. Now, initially, Initially, they told us that we had 0 0.025 moles of hydrogen iodide, okay? And the total pressure was 100 kilopascals. The total pressure was 100 kilopascals, okay? So initially, initially, we had 0 0.025 moles, 0 0.025 moles of hydrogen iodide, okay? And the pressure was 100 kilopascals. That's all we had initially. We didn't have hydrogen and iodine. And at equilibrium, at equilibrium, we don't know the number of moles that we have of hydrogen iodide, but we know that the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide is 86.4 kilopascals. So the initial pressure, the initial pressure, which was the total pressure was just the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide because that was the only gas present. And at equilibrium, the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide is 86.4 kilopascals. Now you guys might remember, you might remember that the pressure is proportional to the number of moles of a gas. The pressure is proportional to the number of moles of a gas under a given set of conditions, right? So over here, if 0 0.025 moles of hydrogen iodide had a total pressure of 100 kilopascals, how many moles of hydrogen iodide have a pressure of 86.4 kilopascals? So if you cross multiply over here, the number of moles of hydrogen iodide is 0 0.0216 moles. Okay, 0 0.0216 moles. So that's the answer. You can do this, you can do this by figuring out the initial amount and the change in amount and the equilibrium amounts and so on, right? But that would be a much longer method. You should be aware that since we're keeping the temperature constant, right? The number of moles of gas is just proportional to the pressure. We know the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide initially and we know the partial pressure at equilibrium, okay? The number of moles is proportional to pressure. So if 0 0.025 moles has a pressure of 100, then n moles has a pressure of 86.4 and we can just figure out n. Another thing to note here is that the final total pressure is not 86.4, okay, because hydrogen and iodine are also being made. Hydrogen and iodine are also being made, so there is some pressure because of those guys as well. This is not the final total pressure. The initial total pressure was just because of hydrogen iodide because that was the only thing present initially. At the end, we do have other gases present. However, since we're only interested in hydrogen iodide, we can just compare the number of moles to the partial pressure of hydrogen iodide to find the number of moles. Part B says use equation 1 and the bond energy values in table 3.1 to calculate the change in enthalpy for the thermal decomposition of one mole of HI gas. Show your working. So for the thermal decomposition of one mole of HI, that would be one HI, right? We would get half a mole of hydrogen and half a mole of iodine, right? And again, everything is in the gaseous state, right? We're using reaction one here. Now, you know, the enthalpy change for a reaction in terms of bond energies is the bond energy of the reactants minus the bond energies of the products, right? That is the bonds broken minus the bonds formed, right? The bond energy of the bonds formed. Those are the ones in the products, right? We're subtracting that because energy is released when the bonds form. So those are negative enthalpy changes, right? The enthalpy change when bonds are formed. So for the reactants, we have one mole of hydrogen iodide. So we have one mole of HI bonds, right? One mole of HI. So that's 299. And then we subtract the bond energies of the products. So we have half a mole of hydrogen gas, so half a mole of HH bonds, 
So 1 over 2 times 436 minus 1 over 2 times 151, right? That's the bond energy of iodine. We have half a mole of iodine gas, so that's half a mole of ii bonds. So the enthalpy change over here comes out to positive 5.5 kilojoules per mole. Describe the effect of increasing pressure on the value of Kp for the decomposition of hydrogen iodide. Temperature is the only factor that affects the value of the equilibrium constant. Okay, so pressure has no effect. It has no effect on the value of Kp. Okay, the only factor that affects the value of the equilibrium constant or for any equilibrium constant is temperature. Part D says HCl gas is prepared by adding sodium chloride solid to concentrated sulfuric acid. HI is not prepared by adding sodium iodide to concentrated sulfuric acid because the HI gas produced also reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid. Identify the type of reaction that occurs when sodium iodide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid to form hydrogen iodide. So initially when sodium iodide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid, we get NaHSO4 and hydrogen iodide. The hydrogen iodide can then react further with the concentrated sulfuric acid. But here in part 1, we just want to know the type of reaction that occurs initially when sodium iodide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid to form hydrogen iodide. That's the first stage. That's the first reaction. This is an acid-base reaction. This is an acid base reaction. Over here, the sulfuric acid is acting as an acid, is donating a proton, right, to the iodide. And then the iodide is gaining a proton. So that's the base. Okay, so it's an acid base reaction. Part 2 says write an equation for the reaction of hydrogen iodide gas and concentrated sulfuric acid. Now, this hydrogen iodide that's formed in the first reaction can react further with concentrated sulfuric acid. The iodide is a very strong reducing agent. So it's able to reduce sulfuric acid all the way to hydrogen sulfide, okay? So what we get over here is iodine, hydrogen sulfide, and H2O, okay? Now this hydrogen iodide can reduce sulfuric acid to sulfur dioxide, it can reduce it to sulfur, it can reduce it to hydrogen sulfide. But for this reaction, for this reaction over here, we're gonna show the most reduced form of sulfur. Hydrogen sulfide is the most reduced form of sulfur, okay? Sulfur has an oxidation number of negative 2 here. And in sulfuric acid, it has an oxidation number of plus 6, okay? So iodide is the reducing agent, right? So it undergoes oxidation to form iodine. So iodide is oxidized from negative 1, right? That's the oxidation number of iodine here to 0. Now you guys should remember this balanced equation, but if you don't, we can balance it right now right we talk about what's being oxidized here the iodine is being oxidized the iodine is being oxidized as the reducing agent from negative 1 to 0 from negative 1 to 0 and the sulfur is being reduced from plus 6 to negative 2 so the change in oxidation number for iodine is plus 1 the oxidation number is increasing by 1 from negative 1 to 0 and the change in oxidation number for sulfur is negative 8. It's decreasing by 8 from plus 6 to negative 2 which means that we need 8 iodine atoms. We need 8 iodine atoms for every 1 sulfur atom. Okay, we need 8 iodine atoms for every 1 sulfur atom. Since the increase and decrease in oxidation numbers has to balance. So we need 8 iodine atoms to be oxidized for every 1 sulfur atom to be reduced. 8 iodine atoms need to be oxidized. That is 4I2, right? That's 8 iodine atoms need to be oxidized for every 1 sulfur that is being reduced. Okay, for every 1 sulfur that is being reduced. So we're going to have 1. So 8 iodines for every 1 sulfur. And then we just need to balance the H2Os. Here we have... 4 times 1, that's 4 oxygens. So we're going to have 4 H2O. Explain why hydrogen iodide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid, whereas HCl does not. So NaCl initially reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid in the same way. However, the HCl doesn't react with sulfuric acid. It's not able to reduce sulfuric acid. 
Why is that? The reason why is because if we talk about the halides, talk about the halides, right? The reducing strength, the reducing strength of the halides decreases down the group. Okay, it decreases down the group. It's easier for the halides to lose electrons and undergo oxidation down the group. Easier to lose electrons and undergo oxidation. So iodide is a much stronger reducing agent than fluoride. Okay, because it's much larger, it loses electrons more readily, it undergoes oxidation more readily. Reducing agents undergo oxidation, right? So iodide is a stronger reducing agent. Okay, is a stronger reducing agent than fluoride. Okay, that's why fluoride is unable to reduce concentrated sulfuric acid. However, iodide is. So here we have question number four. Part A says bromine reacts with butane in the presence of ultraviolet light to form bromobutane. This is an alkane reacting with the halogen in the presence of UV light, right? And one of the hydrogens is substituted for by a bromine. This is free radical substitution. This is free radical substitution. Two structural isomers with the molecular formula C4H9Br are produced during this reaction. Part 1 says draw the two structural isomers and state the systematic name of each isomer. So we have butane. Okay, we have butane, which is CH3, CH2, CH2, and then CH3. And one of the hydrogens, one of the hydrogens in the C4H10 is being substituted for by a bromine. Now the bromine can substitute on this carbon, right? That'll be carbon number one. We get one bromobutane, or it can substitute on the middle carbon. That would be two bromobutane. If it substitutes here or here, it's the same thing, right? On this end or this end, that would be one bromobutane. So one bromobutane would be CH3, CH2, 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 Br. Okay. Doesn't matter if you show the bromine here or here on either end. And the other possibility is that we get CH3, CH2, CH, Br, CH3. Right? It could be on the middle carbon. Doesn't matter if it's here or here. Okay, it's the same thing. So on the left, I have one bromobutane. And on the right, I have two bromobutane. Okay. So in the question says, draw the two structural isomers. You can write down the structural formula. You can draw the skeletal formula like this. Okay, you can draw the skeletal formula. One, two, three, four. Okay. You can also draw the displayed formula or anything in between. Okay, any valid structure. It could be the structural formula, condensed, it could be displayed, it could be skeletal, whatever. Okay. So here we'll just go with the structural formula. Okay, we'll just go with the structural formula. Part two says identify the type of structural isomerism shown in A part one. So these two isomers, okay, they have the same functional group, right? They both they both have bromines. They both have straight chains, so they're not functional group isomers, same functional group. They're not chain isomers because they're both straight chains. However, the bromine is in different positions. Okay, you have the same functional group in different positions. That type of isomerism is position isomerism. Okay, position or positional isomerism. You can say position or positional isomerism. Part D says halothane is an anesthetic. Part 1 says, identify the chiral center in halothane and mark it with an asterisk. So the chiral center over here is the carbon on the right, right? This carbon atom is bonded to four different atoms or groups of atoms, right? Chiral carbon, a chiral carbon or a chiral center is a carbon atom that's bonded to four different atoms or groups of atoms. When halothane reacts in ultraviolet light, homolytic fission occurs and the CBR bond is broken. Part 2 says, construct an equation to show the homolytic fission of halothane. When homolytic fission occurs, right, we form radicals. One electron goes to the bromine and the other electron goes to the carbon. Right? We have homolysis or homolytic fission of the CBR bond. Homolytic means equal bond breaking. One electron goes to each species. So over here we have CF3, CH, Br, Cl undergoes homolytic fission to form CF3. CH, Cl, 
right? The bromine's broken off. So you're left with an unpaired electron on this carbon. That's a radical. And you also get a bromine radical. Okay. The reason why the CBR bond breaks over here, the reason why the CBR bond breaks over here is because the CBR bond is the weakest, okay? Because down the group, the size of the halogens increases, right? So the bond energy decreases, right? Bond length increases, bond energy decreases. So the CF, CCL, and CH bonds are relatively stronger. That's why the CBR bond breaks. Complete figure 4.2 to show the arrangement of electrons in a bromine atom using the electrons in boxes notation. So looking at the periodic table, can you tell me what the electronic configuration of bromine ends with? Here we have argon, we have argon, and then we have 4s2, then we have 3d10, 4s2, 3d10, 4s2, and then 4p1, 4p2, 4p3, 4p4, 4p5, right? It's in the P block, group 17, halogens, the configuration ends with P5. So it ends with 4p5, okay, it ends with 4p5. So we have argon, and then we have 3d10, 3d10, 4s2, and then 4p5. X is an addition polymer. Okay, they've shown the repeat unit of X. Part 1 says draw the monomer of X. Now we have an addition polymer here, right? Addition polymers form when alkenes polymerize. Okay, addition polymers form when alkenes polymerize. So if I have an alkene like this, right? When it polymerizes, the pi bond breaks, the pi bond breaks, right? And we get this repeat unit. Right now over here, in the repeat unit, then every repeat unit, we have two carbon atoms along the main chain, right? Those are the two carbon atoms that were double bonded. So these two carbon atoms, these two carbon atoms used to have a double bond between them, right? So the polymer that we're getting over here is that this carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. This carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. And then this carbon over here is bonded to a CH2Cl, bonded to a CH2Cl, and it's bonded to a hydrogen, right? And then we have our continuation bonds, right? We have our continuation bonds over here. So this is our repeat unit. This is our repeat unit, two carbon atoms along the main chain. Between these two carbon atoms, we initially had a double bond. That was our monomer. So our initial monomer over here is, our initial monomer over here is this guy. Carbon carbon double bond. This carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. This carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. And this carbon is bonded to a hydrogen and a CH2Cl. So, just one reason why the disposal of items made from X is difficult. Now, addition polymers are non biodegradable. Okay? Addition polymers are non biodegradable. So, they're not really broken down in nature, right? So, they are non biodegradable. Okay, that's one reason why they're difficult. Another question I have is why can't I dispose of this by combusting it? I can't dispose of this via combustion because we get harmful combustion products, right? We'd get harmful combustion products over here. That would be HCl, right? Because this polymer over here has a chlorine. Right, it has a chlorine. So you get a harmful combustion product. So you can say non-biodegradable, or you can say that, or you can say that you would get harmful combustion products if you try to compose of them via combustion. So here we have question number five. It says figure 5.1 shows three reactions of two bromopropane. Part A says complete table 5.1 for each reaction. By stating the reagent and conditions used and identify the type of reaction that occurs. So for reaction 1, reaction 1, the bromine is being substituted for, the bromine is being substituted for by an OH group. This is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Okay, this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. We're going to use sodium hydroxide aqueous. Okay. We're going to use sodium hydroxide aqueous and we're going to heat. Okay. So the reagent that we use is NaOH aqueous. Specify the solvent and heat. And this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Specifically, this type of nucleophilic substitution of halogenoalkanes to form alcohols is referred to as hydrolysis. 
So I would say since they're asking for the type of reaction, you can say substitution and also mention that it's hydrolysis. So this is nucleophilic substitution. And specifically, this is hydrolysis of halogenoalkanes. Now, what is reaction 2? In reaction 2, we're substituting the bromine with an NH2 group. We're substituting the bromine with an NH2 group. This again is nucleophilic substitution, but in this case, we're going to use we're going to use ammonia and ethanol, okay, concentrated ammonia and ethanol. Okay, and heat under pressure, okay. Heat under pressure or heat in a sealed tube. Okay. If you heat in a sealed tube, right? If you heat in a sealed tube, as you heat it, the pressure increases. So heating in a sealed tube is the same as heating under pressure. And again, we have a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And then the last reaction that we have is the 2-bromopropane is reacting with something to form an alkene. We're forming propene over here. Now, reaction 3 is elimination. Okay, Reaction 3 is elimination. We're forming an alkene from a halogenoalkene. We're eliminating HBr. We're removing a bromine. Okay, We're removing the bromine and a hydrogen from the neighboring carbon. Removing the bromine and hydrogen from the neighboring carbon. And we end up getting the double bond between these two carbons. Okay. So for elimination of HBr, we use sodium hydroxide again, but we use sodium hydroxide in ethanol. Okay. That's why it's important to specify the solvent, right? In the first case, it's hydrolysis of halogenoalkane, substitution, we use sodium hydroxide aqueous. In the second case, it's elimination, and we use sodium hydroxide in ethanol. So NaOH in ethanol. Okay. And this is referred to as elimination. So we use sodium hydroxide and ethanol and heat. Okay, and this is elimination of halogenoalkanes to form alkenes. A sample of 2 iodopropane reacts under the same conditions as reaction 1 to produce propen 2 all. Explain why 2-iodopropane reacts at a faster rate than 2-bromopropane. So we're doing the same thing here, right? We're replacing the halogen with an OH group. We're replacing the halogen with an OH group, right? In the first case, we had a bromoalkane and we were making an alcohol. In the second case, we have an iodoalkane and we're making an alcohol. The only difference between the two compounds is the only difference between the two compounds is the halogen. So the iodopropane, the 2-iodopropane reacts faster than 2-bromopropane because, because the carbon iodine bond, because the carbon iodine bond is weaker, right? The carbon iodine bond is weaker than the carbon bromine bond, right? Because down the group, the size of the atoms increases. That means that we have a greater bond length and a weaker bond. So over here, we would say that the carbon iodine bond is weaker than the than the carbon bromine bond. In other words, it has a lower bond energy. Okay, you can say it has a lower bond energy, or you can say it's weaker. Okay, it's weaker than the carbon bromine bond. A lower activation energy is needed for the reaction. Lower activation energy means faster rate of reaction, and the reason why a lower activation energy is needed because down the group, down the group, as atomic size increases, okay, atomic size increases, right, the bond length increases, okay, and bond energy decreases. Figure 5.2 shows how butan one all can be made from one bromopropane in three steps. Okay. Butan one all can be made from one bromopropane. So butan one all is a four carbon alcohol, can be made from a three carbon halogenoalkane. In the first step, one bromopropane, one bromopropane is converted to butane nitrile, butane nitrile. Then the nitrile is converted to a carboxylic acid that's butanoic acid 
where we have a carboxyl group and then the carboxylic acid is converted to a primary alcohol. Part 1 says in step 1, one bromopropane reacts with cyanide ions to form butane nitride. Complete figure 5.3 to show the mechanism for step 1. Include charges, dipoles, lone pairs of electrons and curly arrows as appropriate. So this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction, right? The cyanide, the cyanide, the CN, C triple bond N, right? Minus cyanide ion substitutes for bromide. Right? It replaces the bromine over here. CN replaces bromine. So over here we have a partial positive carbon. We have a partial negative bromine. Okay, we have to show the lone pair on the carbon in the cyanide ion, okay, because it's just carbon that attacks the carbon, right? The carbon bonds to the carbon. We're going to show an arrow, a curly arrow from this carbon to this carbon. At the same time, we have heterolysis, right? This is an SN2 mechanism because we have a primary halogenoalkane. It's a one step mechanism, primary halogenoalkane because the carbon with the bromine is bonded to two hydrogens and just one carbon, right? So, primary halogen alkanes favor the SN2 mechanism, which is one step. So, the nucleophile attacks the delta positive carbon and the CBR bond breaks heterolytically in one single step, okay? And we end up getting our product, which is butane nitride, and we get the bromide ion. In step two, butane nitride is heated with HCl aqueous. A hydrolysis reaction occurs. Construct an equation for the reaction in step two. So, in step two, the butane nitrile is undergoing hydrolysis, acidic hydrolysis to form butanoic acid. Okay. Butane nitrile, which is CH3, CH2, CH2, CN, is undergoing acidic hydrolysis to form butanoic acid. It's reacting with H2O in the presence of HCl to form CH3, CH2, CH2, and then CO2H, right? This is hydrolysis of nitriles to form carboxylic acids. And then what does the nitrogen over here become? Since we have acidic conditions, the nitrogen ends up making ammonium, okay? So we get ammonium chloride, okay? We get ammonium chloride, we get ammonium chloride, so NH4Cl. Okay, if you just wanted to show the reaction with H plus, okay, if you wanted to show the reaction with H plus, what happens here is we get ammonium. Okay, so since we have to show the reaction with HCl, okay, I've written HCl is full, but for acidic hydrolysis, you can just show H plus as well. For acidic hydrolysis, you can show H plus as well, but here since they specified HCl aqueous, okay, we're going to write HCl. So we get ammonium chloride. And then to balance this equation, we're going to have two H2O. Step three is a reduction reaction. Construct an equation for the reduction reaction in step three. Use H in square brackets to represent one atom of hydrogen from the reducing agent. So in step three, in step three, the carboxylic acid is being reduced to form a primary alcohol. Butanoic acid is reduced to form butan one all. So over here, we have CH3, CH2, CH2, CO2H, that's butanoic acid, okay. We're going to show four hydrogens here, show four hydrogens, and we end up getting CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2OH, the primary alcohol, and H2O, okay. Notice how two hydrogens are added over here two hydrogens are added and then one oxygen is also lost so we need two more hydrogens for h2o so we need a total of four hydrogens state the identity of a suitable reducing agent in step three so to reduce carboxylic acid we have to use lithium aluminum hydride okay lithium aluminum hydride lialh4 okay this is lithium aluminum hydride in dry ether okay you can specify the solvent, but you have to say LiAlH4. So you have to say LiAlH4, but it has to be anhydrous. Okay, it has to be anhydrous. So I specified that in parentheses. So here we have question number six, which says Z is a molecule which contains the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only. 
Z contains only alkene and carboxyl functional groups. Part A says complete table 6.1 by describing the observations that occur when two different reagents are added to separate samples of Z. So Z contains alkene and carboxyl functional groups. So if Z reacts with aqueous bromine, what would the observation be? Since it has an alkene, a carbon-carbon double bond will decolorize, it will decolorize aqueous bromine. So we get decolorization of aqueous bromine. Okay, decolorization of aqueous bromine. That's basically orange to colorless or brown to colorless. Okay. Aqueous bromine is sort of like an orangish to brown. Okay, so brown or orange to colorless. What about sodium carbonate? We get bubbles of a colorless gas because carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids react with carboxylic acids react with sodium carbonate to form salt, carbon dioxide, and water. So we're going to see bubbles of carbon dioxide. We're going to see bubbles or effervescence. Of carbon dioxide. Table 6.2 shows the percentage by mass of each element present in Z. Use the data in table 6.2 demonstrate that the empirical formula of Z is CHO. Show you're working. So in Z we have carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Let's say I had 100 grams. Let's say I had 100 grams of Z, right? 41.38 grams would be carbon, right? That's the percentage by mass. 3.45 would be hydrogen and 55.17 would be oxygen. For the empirical formula, we have to find the molar ratio between carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. We need to find the number of moles of each of these atoms. So we're gonna divide by the relative atomic mass, okay? So 41.38 divided by 12, hydrogen, 3.45 divided by 1 and then oxygen we're going to divide by 16. So we get the number of moles. We get 3.45 moles of carbon. We get 3.45 moles of hydrogen and we get 3.45 moles of oxygen. So therefore, this is just a 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio, right? If we just divide by 3.45 in the last step, okay? We get the same number of moles of all of them. And this implies that this implies that the empirical formula is equal to CHO. Figure 6.1 shows the mass spectrum of Z. Part 1 says deduce the molecular formula of Z. Explain your answer by referring to the molecular ion peak in figure 6.1 and the empirical formula of Z. The molecular ion peak is at 116, right? That's the M plus peak or the M peak. Okay, that's referred to as the M peak or the M plus peak, right? So therefore, the MR, the MR is 116, right? Because the molecular mass is 116 and the charge is plus 1. So the mass to charge ratio is 116, right? So the MR is 116 because, because we have an M plus peak at or M peak at a mass to charge ratio of 116. The empirical formula for this compound was CHO. So the empirical mass, the empirical mass is equal to 29, right? We have carbon, which is 12 plus 113 plus 16, which is 29. So over here, the MR divided by the empirical mass is equal to 116 divided by 29, which is equal to 4. So the empirical formula is CHO, but the molecular formula is just 4 times that, right? The molecular mass is 4 times the empirical mass, which implies that the molecular formula, which implies that the molecular formula is equal to C4H4O4. Is equal to C4H4O4. Okay, so this is the working you have to show. Use figure 6.1 to suggest the formula of the fragments with mass to charge peaks at 45 and at 71. Now, since they have mentioned that compound Z has a carboxyl functional group, okay, it has a carboxyl functional group, so you should know that the CO2H group has a mass of 45. Okay, it's a common fragment. It's a common fragment that you should know the mass of. Okay, so the CO2H group has a mass of 45. So the fragment that gives us the peak at 45 
is a CO two H plus. Remember, it's the cations that give us the the peaks, right? So this is the fragment that gives us the peak. CO two H mass of forty five, charge of one, so mass to charge is forty five. Okay, and then what species is responsible for the peak at seventy one? What species is responsible for the peak at seventy one? This peak over here is the CO two H plus. And what about 71? Now, if you notice here, the molecular ion peak is at 116, right? That's the MR. That's the MR over here. And the peak at 71 is a result of something with a mass of 45 being removed, right? Because the difference in the mass is 116 minus 71, which is 45, right? So this peak over here, this peak over here is a result of the molecular ion losing something with a mass of 45. So the molecular ion, the molecular ion is C4H4O plus, right? The molecular ion is C4H4O4 plus, right? And when this molecular ion loses a mass of 45, we get the peak at 71, right? This is 116. If we remove 45, we get 71. So this guy is losing a CO2H group to give us the peak at 71. So when C4H4O4 loses a CO2H, what are we left with? Well, we're left with three carbons, right? Because one of the carbons is lost. From the four oxygens, two oxygens are lost. Okay, so we get C3, O2, right? Two oxygens are lost. And then we have one hydrogen being removed from the four. So that's H3. So we get C3, H3, O2 plus, okay? C3, H3, O2 plus. Again, Molecular ion at 116, we remove 45, we get 71. So we're removing CO2H. If we remove CO2H, we're removing one carbon, that's C3. We're removing one hydrogen, that's H3, and we're removing two oxygens. So we're left with C3H3O2 plus. Suggest the structure of Z using relevant information from table 6.1, parts B and C. Now, table 6.1 told us that a carbon carbon double bond and a carboxyl group were present in the compound, right? Carbon carbon double bond and a carboxyl group were present, right? That's table 6.1. So we know for a fact that a carbon carbon double bond is present. We know for a fact that a carboxyl group is present. And then parts B and C, parts B and C told us the molecular mass and the molecular formula. So we know the molecular formula over here is C4H4O4. So over here we know we have a four carbon compound. We know we have a four carbon compound, right? We know we have a carboxylic acid group. And over here we should be able to deduce that we have two carboxylic acid groups. We have two carboxyl groups, okay? We have two carboxyl groups because we have a total of four oxygens. We have a total of four oxygens. So two oxygens for the first carboxyl group and then two oxygens for the second carboxyl group and the carboxyl groups have to come at the ends right because we can't have carboxyl groups in the middle we also know we have a carbon carbon double bond that has to be over here and then obviously we have two more hydrogens which have to be over here okay so this is the structure of z okay this is the structure of z